And hello, this is Eamon O'Brien, and you're so welcome to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And coming up today, we're going to talk about what Mark Schaefer can teach you about engaging content. And Mark, I'm so delighted that you've joined us all the way from Tennessee. Well, uh, and thank you for inviting me to the Expert Club and lowering your standards so much. Well, but before we get into the lowering of standards, I want to tell people a little bit about Mark, for those who don't know, that Mark, you are the founder of Schaefer Marketing Solutions, but you're also an educator uh, at Rutgers and elsewhere, and the author of so many books. And one of those is my favorite of the year. It is Breaking the Content Code. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's an awesome, awesome read. And I have to say, actually, that, Mark, before we get into chatting about the book, that I want to tell you that one of my highlights of meeting you in San Diego, I only popped over to say hello, and two beers later, <laughs> we had had an awesome conversation. So you live the, 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 the words that you speak in this book. Well, to me, I mean, that's really uh, the magic of connecting through social media and uh, really a lesson uh, for everyone that through the social web and the content we create, it usually just opens the door for, for weak relational connections. But, uh, and it opens the doors to so many places you never ever would have had the opportunity before, but you still have to work to create those stronger links through something like a beer with a new friend and then once that happens, you never know where it will lead. And here I am today. Exactly that, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, as I read your book, and I, I've read it literally from cover to cover. I did it in about four hours. I, I enjoyed it so much. Um, I was really struck by just the cascade of events that have come together and what's happening today in terms of noise out there. So maybe you talk a little bit about that. Just how bad have things become? Well, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of surprised and, and alarmed by what's happening on the web today. But if you look at it, it's really kind of predictable that each time we have a new marketing trend or a new uh, digital way to connect with people, th the early adopters have an advantage. So the first people that had a website had an advantage. Then it got difficult. The first people that figured out search engine optimization had an advantage. Then it became crowded and, and expensive. And it's the same today with social media and content marketing. The, the first people that figured it out had an advantage. And now people see it works. We need to be there. The amount of content on the web is exploding. And you know, conservative projections show that in the next five years, the amount of information on the web is going to increase by 500%. So I know. It's, it's like five internets are coming at us. So yeah, I've been obsessed with this idea of what do we do? How do we maneuver in this environment? How do we stand out? And so that led to my research and, and writing the book. Yeah, which was an awesome idea. And I have to say that you're right about the noise. In fact, I'm giving a talk over in the UK next week. And part of that talk is about just how much noise there is out there. And basically, it's like this. There's another three websites. That's the speed at which yeah. extra noise is appearing online. It's extraordinary. Yeah, there's it's there's the gr the good side and the bad side. I mean, the good side is <clears throat> we're in such a wonderful time, <clears throat> such a magical time, where all of us can have a voice, all of us can reach a new audience, and 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 influence has been democratized. Everybody can go for it, and everybody can publish. The downside of that is everybody can publish. And so there, we're all cons competing for the same, you know, limited attention span. And that's exactly right. And so the, the upshot, I suppose, is that, that the stakes have gone up. And so in terms of what it's going to take to inspire folks in the future, well, first of all, to be seen, first off, and secondly, to inspire people, I guess the rules of engagement have changed. Well, um, 
I think the rules of engagement, that's one of the things, the difficulties of being in marketing today is, I mean, when you and I were, were growing up in the business world, the way you go to market was pretty clear cut. You had a couple television stations, you had daily newspapers, um, yeah. your radio, you throw in a little PR and your job is done. And today, not only are the channels so fragmented and the audiences so fragmented, but the rules of engagement keep changing. People are figuring out new ways to use these tools every day, ways that the, the people who founded these technologies never even imagined. So it is really, really challenging uh, to, to cut through uh, and, and, and be the signal instead of the noise today. Oh, oh, it is. Well, I can tell you just you were, you were talking about, you know, you and I, and it's nice to meet somebody who's been in the game actually longer than I have, and there aren't okay, many. Okay, we don't need to go there. We don't need to go there. But, but I was going to tell you that uh, back in the early 90s, I used to make a lot of commercials with MCI. I made about 300 of them in three years, and uh, interruption marketing, of course. And the curious thing is that we used to talk about time-based competition then because we had a competitor, AT&T, who would respond to us in five days. <laughs> Today, that would be a pipe dream. Yeah, wow, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, I love that story. And I think the whole idea of real-time connection and real-time responses is kind of sorting out. There's some vast implications for response time, isn't there? I mean, uh, you know, you almost need to have a team of people monitoring and responding 24 hours a day. So it's, it's, it's forcing change. There's a lot of tension in marketing and advertising right now to try to figure out culturally and organizationally how do we respond to these new platforms. Yeah, and therein actually lies the issue and why I was so interested in your book because, you know, obviously I, I produce content for speakers to speak better online and offline, but there's a, a major league issue in terms of uh, outreach and the quality and depth of message and actually creating something that can travel, something that can share. And I know this is something you're very hot on. Maybe you talk a little bit about just what it takes now to share and actually some of the gory stories about your experiences maybe <laughs> well first of all i want to commend you that the advice that you're giving is exactly correct that you know the the journey starts with excellent content that deserves to travel so you know my the message in my book which certainly you're reinforcing today is that Content is the starting line. It's not the finish line. It's the starting line. So you have to create content that is helpful, that is useful, that is, is customer-centric, not sales-centric. That's how we connect with people yeah. today. So if you're ready to make that commitment, then you're ready for my book. And you're ready to find out, okay, how do we optimize that content with an, with an emotional message? How do we learn about why people share content, where they share content, how they share content? And once you start exploring these ideas, it is absolutely mesmerizing. I mean, the idea of sharing content is a very personal and intimate decision. You bet. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not an economic decision. And... So often, our knee-jerk reaction is to turn to SEO and advertising and promotion. There's a yep. place for that, but that's not why people share content. And so we have to, you know, my book is a call to action to dig, to go a, a, a level deeper and understand the psychology and sociology and mechanics and sometimes even art and magic about why content moves. We need to be thinking about this as a competency, developing this as a competency, because if we don't, then the content just sits there. It, de it delivers no economic value. Well, and I can think about that on two levels, and maybe then I'd segue back into one of your stories, because one of the things that I'm constantly talking about when it comes to speaking is that less is more and you need to amplify things in, in, through story and through other things that help people to see what you're talking about. 
because no one has the time to pay attention. But I'd like to kind of flip back because one of the things that really struck me was your story, an awesome story about how you rose, rose how you raised uh, uh, some some six thousand dollars for yeah. kids at, at risk, and yeah. what you found from you know we all crave these extraordinary followings online was mind blowing. Maybe you share yeah. that story. Well, it, 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 on the surface, it does seem mind blowing, but I think for the people in the business that it really was no surprise. And the point I was trying to make through this story is that audience size does not equal action. It kind of no. gets back to what we first started out talking about the weak connections versus the strong relational links that really are actionable. So the story you're referring to, I wrote a blog post asking for people to donate money to a charity. And I know that's a perilous, a perilous task on the web to begin with, uh, but I believe strongly in what I, in the charity and I wanted to help them out. So a bunch of big bloggers got behind me and they said, yes, this is great. It's a great story. Uh, we want to help you. And so uh, they promoted this post and I estimated my blog post asking for donations uh, had a reach of three, three million possible viewers. And the result was one donation, one donation uh, that was about $10. So uh, it, it's like that is the worst sales conversion rate in history. That's like, <laughs> the, that's like the black hole of conversion rates. You're stucking value out of this, this opportunity. Now, now, on my blog community, I raised $6,000 in 48 hours. Why? Those people, most of those people, I met them through the blog community, but I also met almost all of them in real life, which gets back to this point that, you know, once you and I met, that begins to open up new opportunities. And here we are collaborating today. Yeah. And, and you never know where that will, will lead in the future. I mean, we'll probably find ways to work to for, you know, with each other for a long time to come. That's how the, work, the, the web works. And people look at these people that have, you know, you know 100,000, 200, 500,000 on the people on the web. And they said, oh, if I could just get them to tweet something of mine, it would change my life. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. We still have yeah. to do the hard work to build those relationships. Now, the people who are actionable, the people who have that connection to you, in the book, I describe this as the alpha audience. And so we need to turn our attention away from these big numbers and web traffic that really does nothing for our business. They're simply tourists to a website and really focus our energy and our heart and our passion and our resources on this elite group of people who help us. Those are the people who are moving the needle for our business. It might be 2% or less of your followers. And what I'm challenging individuals, speakers, your listeners today, businesses, organizations, do you know who they are? I would suggest you probably don't. Yeah. And we may have the, the wrong metrics in place to really see uh, are we rewarding the right people in our businesses who are helping to move our content, support our businesses? Uh, do we really know who our alpha audience is? Yeah, and I like what you're saying there because, you know, and, and the word relationship keeps appearing in the sentence. I, I see, I think that's critical because if you want a conversation to continue after you've got somebody interested in something, then they need to care. And the more they know about you, the more they trust in you, the more likely they are to um, feel, A, I'm confident in doing that, and B, that I kind of ought to because that person matters to me. Well, it's, it's exactly right. It, it's almost like, let's say you have a local uh, bakery and you have some regular customers that come in all the time. Well, it's easy to see them. It's easy to know them. You can walk over, chat with them, pat them on the back, congratulate them because their, their daughter just won an award. 
maybe every once in a while give them some free cookies or give them a free cup of coffee because you appreciate them and you love them. And, and I, I just use the word love. <laughs> that's yes. a word we don't. That's a, a word that we don't toss around in in business very often. But I bring this up very plainly in in the book that you know there are people out there who love us. We shouldn't be afraid to say that word. I think and and think about how do we love them back? How do we acknowledge them because they are the ones who are helping us with our our businesses. And we, that's where we need to turn our attention. We need to con turn the conversation from traffic to trust. That's, that's a big message, a big theme that runs throughout the book. Yeah. And actually, to, to, to that end, actually, one of the things that you and I found ourselves doing a lot over in San Diego, and we're doing it again today, is we spend a lot of time talking about story. And of course, story matters if you can bring the audience into whatever you're talking about. What role does that play in terms of nurturing and developing long term and like, better relationships online as well as off? That's a wonderful question. One of my favorite uh, case studies in the book was from this little winery in Provence. And this guy was my hero. His name's Stephen Cronk. And he, he, he quit his job as an executive in London and moved his family to Provence in the middle of a recession to start a winery. And uh, so, so I, I, he asked for my help to, on some marketing advice. And one of the things that we saw was he has 600 competitors in the small region of Provence uh, that make rosé wine, but we discovered none of them were really telling their story, at least in a digital way. And one of the things I loved about Stephen was he, when I first started to know him, he sent me this video and he's standing on top of this giant grape harvester and uh, he, he's telling his story and he said, you know, many people uh, think that people, we still harvest the grapes by hand. Well, I want to show you today how we really harvest grapes. And this giant machine started to move and Stephen was losing his balance and he was still telling this story. And here's what made me align with Stephen and take him on as a client. He kept that in the video. He didn't say, oh, I'm falling. Let's start over. Yeah. He kept that mistake in the video. It made him more accessible. It made him more human. And I thought, this is a guy who knows how to tell stories. I'm in. Let's work together. He's a wonderful storyteller. He involves his, his problems, his family, his pets. Uh, one of the most striking things is he was – kneeling beside some decimated grapevines and he looked up at the video camera and his voice was choking up and said this is what happens to my to my grapevines after 13 minutes of hail and this can't help but bring people into the story and we're like not just loving the wine but we're cheering for this business and this family that's trying to make it and, and over a period of years, he was able to, to connect this audience he was, he was building into wine sales and show he was building this emotional connection and people were asking for the wine in different parts of the world. So it was a wonderful success story that was 100% built on the power of connection and story. Yeah, and, and I like that for two reasons. Firstly, because you now brought me into the winery and I'm remembering drinking rosé wine when I lived in Aix-en-Provence all those years ago. And, and the second thing is that um, you can see really um, why people would want to cheer somebody else on because they feel like, you know what, he's like us. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I mean, some of the, some of the, my favorite videos were when he was talking about uh, the problems he was having. One of the most charming videos was he was at his desk and he was just exasperated talking about all the paperwork he faced trying to run a business in France. Um, he had a video, his children 
were being silly on vacation and they were doing a dance to that happy song. And he turned the video camera on and he made it into a little music video. And he's inviting us in behind the scenes of his business and his life. And one, another theme in the book is I think that the, 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 the more we can cre connect to people in a human way, even in a big company, that's what people crave. That's in our DNA. That, that's who we connect with. That's who we want to learn from. That's who we want to do business with, the people that we know and trust. And through social media today and our content, we have this historically important opportunity to do that, to recapture the village square, the local marketplace. Even though we're a big company selling on a global scale, that's difficult. But uh, you know that that's the challenge. I think that's the killer app as we go forward. The more the more human the company, the the will win. Yeah, and actually, before I let you go, because I think that that is a great note, uh, almost in which to end. Um, I was so jealous, I have to tell you, when we met, because you got to be mentored by one of the most awesome writers on leadership ever. Yeah, and um, Peter Drucker. Just, I, I think I must have devoured everything that he wrote back in the '90s, and then I was thinking, oh, I need to re revisit it again. But. Mm -hmm. He was all about that humanity. If there was one word I'd put in the sentence, yeah. it, it was that. And maybe you'd share one of the things that you learned, or two, one or two things that you learned from him and that really still apply today because sometimes we need to re be reminded about these things. You know, uh, Peter Drucker is, is certainly one of the greatest management marketing authors in, and consultants in, in history. And I was very, very fortunate to actually to learn from him and study under him for three years. And there's not a, he's the wisest man I've ever known. And not only was he wise and a great educator, he was a, a, the, just the kindest man. He was almost like a grandfather type of, of figure. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about something that he says. And you know, his books are as fresh today as they were when he wrote them. I was rereading a book last week, one of my favorite books called Entrepreneur and Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He wrote this in 1984 and basically predicted the entrepreneurial economy that we have today and set out guidelines about how to succeed in that environment. And uh, I guess one of the main things that he just drilled into me in our studies that he is he would teach by the case study method and um, you know he was surrounded by all these vice presidents and all these you know alpha male you know uh, vice presidents and, and yes, and yes I'm right the carpet for you driven people and and they all want to solve the problem and they want to solve the case and he would get so angry and he would say what makes you think what makes you so arrogant that you think you know more than these people that you can solve the problem your goal as a leader is to have the right questions not the right answers and that has served me very well in my business and in my consulting because i think we need to approach business and our and our and our clients very humbly and and you know, point them in the right direction through our questions instead of trying to solve all the problems. I like that because if you ask a question, it's necessarily involving. So that's wonderful. And I, th yeah, I think that was really the key to, to his success. And he gave lots of examples of how he would look around and ask questions and it would kind of open people's eyes to the problems that they had. So it's, it's something that I, I use every day. Well, listen, I want to thank you, Mark, for joining with me today. It's been really, really terrific. I much appreciate it. Many thanks. And thanks for the fine interview. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, good. Well, thank you for doing that. And, and thank you for watching the Reluctant Speakers Club today. And until the next time, happy speaking.